Come join us as we explore what it means to be the church and study God's purpose and intention for us as the body of Christ in this place. Now we come to this story. It was an early morning. You're up this morning. You could probably imagine it. Gray skies, a, a dark time there in the morning as the sun was just beginning to peak above the hills, that there was a small group of women who were walking slowly on their way through the garden to a tomb. Now, if you've been in the church any amount of time, this is probably an image that you're familiar with. This group of women who were there walking on their way. You could probably even picture it if you've heard it enough. Imagine the scene of three or four women uh, clutching their cloaks close to them in the cold, their shoulders probably hunched down a bit as they made their way to the tomb. And you could probably even imagine their eyes and what they looked like as they walked on without any hope. Because that morning they didn't have hope. They walked to that tomb expecting to find a dead body, expecting to bury a dead body not expecting what might be possible. Now, maybe you can sympathize with a feeling like that, a feeling of hopelessness, a time in your life where you have struggled, or maybe even right now where you can't seem to find hope in where you are. Well, I know why those women were without hope that morning. It was because they were living in a world without Jesus, because that is what a world without Jesus looks like. It is a world without hope. And if you're living a life without Jesus, if you're living a life without Jesus right now, if you're here this morning living that life without Jesus, you have every much, as much right and reason to be as hopeless as those women were. You have every right and reason to be just as hopeless as those women were on that morning. Because without the resurrection, what do you have? All you have is darkness, emptiness. I mean, looking forward to essentially death, and that's it. That's what we find without the resurrection. And whether you know Jesus and simply haven't been living as though he's alive, or you've never met him without Jesus, what we find is hopelessness. But like what these women were about to find out, there is a greater truth there. There is a greater truth that God is waiting to reveal. And they find that when they come to the tomb because that tomb is empty and Jesus lives. And the thing is, he didn't just have a resurrection happen to him. It wasn't just that there was a resurrection. It wasn't just that he came alive and that's it. But as we know, as we read, he is the resurrection. Because he is our very living hope. And Jesus is the resurrection and the life that you need this morning. So this morning, wherever you stand with God right now, you need the hope and the power of the resurrection in your life, the very resurrection life, which is the life of Jesus Christ living in you. And this is what we know this morning on this Resurrection Sunday, because he is risen. And what we see in our text today is exactly that. So as Pat already read for us, we're turning to Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 9. Again, that's Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 9. If you're not there yet, Join me there. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can grab one of the Pew Bibles in front of you. It's on page 1125 in the Pew Bible. Again, that's 1125 there in the Pew Bible. As we're reading through this story, now if you're familiar at all with, with the Bible, you'll know we got a few accounts of the resurrection. Each of the gospel writers, the four gospel writers, gave, a, gave their, their perspective on the resurrection, how it happened. Each of them giving us a little more detail than the other. Well, when we come to Luke's account that we're looking at today, we get to see the resurrection and we get to see a question that is posed to these women as they come to the tomb and a response is meant to be had when they find that tomb empty. So that's what we'll see. And as we go through this, what we're going to be looking at is first Jesus's death because we do start in that place. We're going to see Jesus's resurrection and we're going to see that Jesus himself is the resurrection and the life. So Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, and Jesus himself, the resurrection and the life, is what we see today as we go through this. Now we do begin in a sad place, 
And we should. We begin in the death of Jesus. So perhaps you haven't been with us this past week, but the story of it begins on Palm Sunday. We started last week, last Sunday, in the Palm Sunday story, at the beginning of what we sometimes call Holy Week. We celebrated that time last week. And maybe you're familiar with it in church. If, again, if you've been to Baptist, non-denominational, Bible churches, a, a standard way of celebrating that is to get the kids all out with palm leaves, you know, and to have them go around the church waving them and singing Hosanna. It's an exciting time. But the day we know was a day of failed expectations. See, Palm Sunday wasn't just about praising God. It was about people who expected something from Jesus that Jesus was not providing. See, Jesus knew what to expect. When he walked into that city, into Jerusalem that day on Palm Sunday, he knew he was signing his death warrant. He knew that by going to that city, he was sealing his fate because the leaders wanted him dead. He knew what he was doing. The crowds, though, they expected something different. The crowds had come, and they were expecting a king. A king that would conquer the Romans, kick them out, and give Israel the freedom that they wanted. That's what they were looking for. They saw the problem outside. They didn't see the problem inside themselves. And Jesus was concerned about what was on the inside. And Jesus made this purpose clear to them. You probably remember the story. It wasn't long after he got into the city. He went into the temple. He went out to, it was likely out there in the court of the Gentiles, where the world was supposed to gather to worship God, and he found that whole place filled with tables and chairs and money and sellers who were selling all sorts of things that you needed for the temple worship and also to make a profit for the religious leaders. And all of this pushing out those who would want to come and worship God. And Jesus saw this. It made him angry. He flipped those tables over. He made a whip out of cords and he drove the people out of that area saying, my house is to be a house of prayer And as we know from the Old Testament, it says prayer for all nations. That was what it was meant to be, and the people weren't doing it. You could imagine if Jesus did that, it didn't make the religious people very happy to see him come in and throw over their tables and toss their money around the temple. So he made them angry pretty quick. But even the crowds turned against him pretty soon as well. Even by the second day, as he was teaching them, he said those words that we've been over several times that he told the crowds that I am to be lifted up and exalted. And they knew what he meant. Because in Isaiah, we are told to be lifted and exalted. It means he is to be the suffering servant who is supposed to die, not the conquering king to kick out the Romans. And so... One way or another, Jesus drove away all the people. And he was left there with just his closest followers. And so we get to Monday, Thursday that we celebrated. Monday, Thursday, where Jesus gathered his disciples together to celebrate Passover. And he took them to the upper room. And he taught them. And he loved on them. And he gave them a new commandment. As he said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And then he showed what that commandment looked like by washing their feet and by breaking bread with them. And he showed his love to them that night. But he knew what was coming because he finished dinner and he took them out to the garden to pray where we picked up on Good Friday. Because it was in the garden as they were together. As Jesus was praying with his disciples, knowing what was to come, knowing that the betrayer Judas had already sold him out to those religious authorities for 30 pieces of silver. And so it was as he was praying, armed men came to arrest him. Judas came up and kissed him on the cheek to show who he was. They took him away. And even as he was being taken, all the disciples deserted him, ran from him. And then Jesus was taken from one trial to another. He was accused of things he didn't do. He was beat upon, he was spat upon, and yet he went through it all. Like they say in silence, like a lamb led to the slaughter, just as scripture had told us would happen. And so he was accused, and eventually they took him before the legal authorities, the Roman authorities, and they demanded that he be crucified. And eventually the governor Pilate gave in and gave orders that he would be crucified. He was taken out by the soldiers. They beat him mercilessly. 
until even as we read in Isaiah, he didn't even look like a man because of the wounds on him, the flesh stripped off and the blood streaming down as they beat him with that scourge, as they press the crown of thorns into his head, as they mocked him and then took him out to nail him to that tree. And it was on that tree, on the very cross where they nailed him, that he died. He was dead. They took his body down. They put him in the tomb. They set a stone in front of the tomb, sealed the stone, and put guards up to keep it safe. Now, from any human perspective, this was utterly hopeless. The Romans had made sure he was dead. There was no hope to be found there, it seemed. Now, I bring this up on Easter morning, which is a time of rejoicing, because it's good to go back to that place, to remember that that is the world without Jesus. Without Jesus, there is no hope. But the story doesn't end there. The story doesn't end there. We start in Jesus' death, but we move to Jesus' resurrection because we pick it back up in that morning. That dark morning as those women were going out, after two hopeless days, now on the dawning of the third, several women went out to the tomb. They had their expectations. They knew what to expect. And that's what we see in the text here. We look at this first verse here, Luke 24, verse 1, and see their expectation. We read this, like Pat has already read for us. Listen to these words. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They had prepared. See, these women came prepared for something. But what they came prepared for was for a dead body. Their expectation was that maybe they could get into the tomb. Maybe they could get to his body, and then they could take care of it. Because they were expecting a dead body. But Jesus had already spent the entire week tossing out all the expectations of everyone around him. He threw aside the expectations of the religious leaders, the crowds, even his own disciples. And he was about to do it again. Of course, we look at these women. At least they were willing to go out because we know what the disciples were doing at this time. The disciples were hiding in houses behind locked doors because they were terrified of what the Romans might do to them after, the, after all they killed their, his, their Lord. What might they do to them? But these women went out doing a right action but still having the wrong expectation. Now, you might be able to imagine that. I'm sure you've come into life before with some wrong expectations, entered situations where you expected one outcome and got a very different one. We come to a lot of things with wrong expectations. And I think sometimes we come to Jesus with wrong expectations. Perhaps you come to Jesus and you really don't expect anything. You imagine this is just dead faith, not much going on. Or maybe, maybe at least live like that, that you don't live in expecting Jesus to actually be power in your life. But God will break those expectations. And just like all broken things that God goes into God's hands, God can make something better than if they'd never been broken. God will certainly give us better expectations, and that is what Jesus did that morning. Because the expectations we see are very much broken for these women as they get to that tomb. Picking up here in verse 2, verse 2 and verse 3, we read this. And they found, well, not the stone in front of the tomb, not soldiers guarding it, not a dead body there, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They got to that tomb, and they were expecting to find something, but they didn't find what they were looking for. They didn't even just find an empty tomb. No, they did not find what they were looking for. They found something even better an even better expectation that was given to them. We keep reading here from verse 4. Because as they're standing there perplexed, wondering what's going on, we read, while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you? while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the and on the third day rise. And they remembered his 
words. We see a very different result here than what they expected. They got to the tomb. They didn't just find it empty, though. As they got to it, as they were perplexed, wondering what happened here, they were confronted by two angels. And imagine that scene. They were coming on a dark morning, expecting to find a dark tomb and a dead Savior. Instead, they were confronted by two angels in dazzling apparel. That means blinding apparel as they step before them. They fall down in fear. Interesting, I don't hear as much. Usually you have the, don't, don't fear, don't fear, get up, it's okay. Here, though, they just, they proclaim the truth to them. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? Don't you remember what Jesus said? Jesus told you this would happen. Why are you seeking him here? He is alive. Give these words here. Remember. Do you not remember what he said? You know what? They do remember. We see that they remember. It comes back to mind all that he has taught them. But here's the thing about remembering. See, what happens when they remember? Verse 9 gives us that. When they remember, they did that, this. And returning from the tomb... They told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. That's a result of remembering. Because in Scripture, remembering is not just a thought process. It's not just something coming to mind and good. It's a piece of information. In Scripture, when we're told to remember, it is an expectation to act on it. You get, God shows this all the time. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, go back to Genesis. Look at the story of Noah and the ark. As that ark is out there on the waves being tossed around... What happens? God remembers those on the ark. Well, God's not just, you know, forgot that they were there and then all of a sudden was like, oh, I wonder how Noah and his family are doing. I hope they don't die. No, he steps into the situation and makes them safe and brings them to safety. In the same way as we've been going over in Exodus, when it came to the children of Israel, when they were in bondage to Egypt, it wasn't when their cries went up to God and God remembered the covenant it wasn't that God had forgotten about them and then it thought, oh, oh, yeah, those people in Egypt. Well, I sure hope they get free one day. No, he remembers and he acts on it. He goes and he delivers them. When something is remembered, we are to act on it. And when we remember the promises of God, we act on those promises. We step and live as though they are true. And they had been given this promise. They had been told that he would die. And three days later, he would rise again. And they acted on that promise when they remembered that. And how did they act on it? They went with joy to share the good news. You know, we need to remember in the same way. We need to remember this as well. And in the same way, our Savior lives, and that makes a difference in our life. When we remember that, we act on that. And we can act in the same way that they act, by telling people about it. And we can also act in that by living as though it is true in our lives. And for some, maybe many of us here, you need to remember this again. You know it. You have it down. You believe in it. But you need to remember it again and act upon it this morning. For others, maybe you need to remember it for the first time. Maybe you need to remember it for the first time because you have not known it. But now we know this promise. Jesus is alive and we have a purpose in him. We must remember that and remember his words, what he taught. Now, there, there, are, there are words to remember. You have words to remember. I am sure that if you thought for a few seconds, you could think of somebody, maybe your mother, your father, maybe a teacher, uh, may, maybe a friend who gave you words that you remember to this day, things that you hold on to, things that guide your life. I actually was remembering some as I was thinking of this. Not too many years ago, not many, about six or seven years ago, I was given some words from a, a mentor of mine, Pastor Joel out in Lindenville, Vermont. And while we were talking about next steps and plans for life, he simply looked at me and said, go, go, go follow what God, you know God is telling you to do. Those are words I remember to this day. When God calls me, what do I do? I go, I obey those are words to remember. You probably have your own. But more important than any words you may have down yourselves that you may have gotten from somebody else, the most important words are Jesus' words for us to remember. And Jesus has a lot of words, a lot of words that he gives. In fact, 
In the next couple weeks, we're going to be jumping into the Sermon on the Mount. I'm excited to give his words. But we're going to look at some of his words here this morning. Some words from him about the resurrection. As Jesus talks about being the resurrection and the life. These are the words that Jesus spoke when he was in front of a different tomb. These were words that Jesus spoke only two weeks before the crucifixion. Before the tomb of Lazarus. Now some of you may know that story. The story of Lazarus, the man who had died. This man was a friend of Jesus'. It was only about two weeks or so before the Passover time. And Jesus had gotten the news that Lazarus is dying. He's not going to make it. Jesus, get here before he dies. Maybe he could be saved. But Jesus didn't. Jesus waited. He waited until Lazarus had died. And then he went to the tomb. And when he got there, there was already a crowd. And he met Martha. Martha, whose sister Mary was one of those... Mary was one of those at the tomb with those spices for Jesus only two weeks later. But here it's her sister Martha who meets with Jesus. And as she's grieving for her loss, Jesus meets with her. We read this. Now, I'll give you a second to turn there. John 11 is where we're going to look at that. John 11, looking at verse 17 to hear these words of Jesus. If you have that pew Bible, it's going to be at page 11, 20, or 1142. Again, 1142 there in that pew Bible. As we look at Jesus' words about the resurrection. Words for us to remember. We read this as we pick up in verse 17. When Jesus came, remember, two weeks before the crucifixion, Jesus is here. When Jesus came, he found Lazarus had already been dead in the tomb for four days. The time has passed. He was too late. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, he went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. What a promise to be given there. But Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. We see a character there in Martha. We see what's going on. Jesus arrived, seeming to be late. Lazarus is dead, long dead, four days dead. Martha was certainly hoping that Jesus would have made it on time. But she's showing great faith here. She says to Jesus, Jesus, I trust you. Whatever you ask, God will give. I believe you can do anything, essentially, she is saying. And she also trusts in the hope of the resurrection. She speaks of the resurrection at the last days. I know he'll rise again. But here's a key, and Jesus corrects her. Because resurrection is great, but a resurrection is not enough. It's not enough to just trust in some resurrection I mean, even in the case of Lazarus, think about it for a moment. Spoiler alert here. Jesus raises him back to life. But guess what? One day again, he died. And poor guy, he had to experience that twice. I don't know how much it was, if it was worth it, but it's a great story for us and to encourage us. Lazarus would die again because a resurrection is not enough. Simply coming back to life is not enough. It's not enough to trust in an afterlife. This was something... You, Martha didn't quite understand yet. She, she was almost there, but not there yet. But the same is true for us. It's not enough for you to believe in heaven. It's not enough for you to believe that your good works can get you through. It's not enough to believe on anything in life at all unless you trust in a person. Because you need to trust in Jesus Christ. Nothing else. And that's what Jesus points her to. As we continue going here, Jesus responds to this in such a loving way to this grieving woman, but he speaks the truth to her. Before he raises Lazarus, before he even promises that he's going to raise Lazarus, he gives her the truth she needs. And so he says to her, I am the resurrection in the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? 
See, Jesus doesn't offer the resurrection to her. Jesus offers himself to her. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Not I'm just giving you a resurrection or I'm giving you a life. I am the resurrection and the life. So I am giving myself. And listen to those words there. Do you believe? Because if you believe in him, like he says, if you die, guess what? You get to live. Yeah, because mm, unless the Lord comes back sooner, you're all going to die. But the hope is you will live. But not only that, if you live, you will never die. Look at that hope. That is an eternal life right now. Because why? Not because it's just some, some thing you're given or some power you're given, but it's the very life of Christ you are given when you trust on him. It's accepting his life as your life. And so he asked that question, do you believe this? And that is a question for you this morning as well. Because Jesus asked that this day, do you believe this? That he is the resurrection and the life. Because he proved that to us 2,000 years ago with an empty tomb. And because he lives, we can have hope. Now, do you believe it? What could this mean for you? I mean, this is a 2,000-year-old story that we are retelling once again. What does this mean for you today? I heard a quote recently I really liked, so I wrote it down to to be able to read it here. The author of it was saying this, some people come to the Bible or listen to it at church in order to be inspired. But that's not why God gave us the Bible. That's not why we're called together into the church. The Bible isn't a collection of inspirational sayings, something to get you through the week, something to perk you up. It's a story from those who had the front row seat. You don't come to Christianity you don't come to church to be inspired. You come because it's true. This is the truth. The resurrection is true. And because it is true, Jesus offers you hope. The hope of a new life. Paul the Apostle. A man who would be called to Christ after he persecuted Christians himself. And spend, yet spend the rest of his life, once he was called serving God in some of the hardest situations you could imagine, from shipwrecks to beatings. He followed after Jesus, and he did what the Lord called him to, and yet he did it with great hope because of the resurrection. And these verses, he, he wrote in Galatians, Galatians 2.20, this right here. Oh, if it comes up, I'll read it for you. He wrote this, I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That is what resurrection life looks like. It's not just something you're given that's separate and apart, a special power to get you through. It is the very resurrection life of Jesus that you can have. If you will remember those words and trust in him. So yes, trusting in Jesus and the resurrection, it brings hope for the future because you know you have an eternal home. But even right now, it brings life to you to live because you will experience your eternal life now. And the result of it is this. Yes, you will die one day, but you will live. And you can live now with that eternal life. Now, it doesn't make everything easy. You know, it doesn't make the clouds go away. It doesn't let you have this rosy outlook on everything. Well, in fact, Jesus said that himself as he spoke to the disciples. They might have been thinking exactly that. Well, Jesus, if we have your life and everything, I bet it's going to be great going on here. But he told them in John 16, I have said these things to you all about love and the resurrection and the hope they have. He said these things that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. So do you want peace? Do you want purpose in your life? Do you want the power to overcome? 
trust in Jesus. It is only in his life that we can find it. And remember those words. And remember, remember means act upon it. Not just bring it to mind, but act on this truth that Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Trust in him today. Then if you believe that, if you can answer, yes, I believe it, then step out as though it is true. And whether it's the first time or for the thousandth, trust him and walk in that new life. Because this is what we know it's true. We know the gospel is true. And the gospel is this, that you and me, all of us, you are a sinner. You are a sinner who has fallen from grace, who before God stands in judgment, and you deserve death and hell. But God the Father loves you so much that he didn't leave you there. No, he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to earth to become man. And he lived that perfect life that you were meant to live, and yet you failed to live every day. And then he went to that cross to pay for your sins. And he died there, taking your sins upon him. But the story didn't end there. Because on the third day that we celebrate today, he rose again in victory to give us our hope that we know that we can live in the resurrection and the life because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We have this hope. You have access right now to the very life of Christ because this day we know that he is risen. He is risen indeed.